Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, give my thanks to three groups of people that are very much on my mind as we start. Uh, the first is uh, Oda-san and uh, Harada-san and their companies. Uh, I'm really very grateful for their uh, excellent partnership over these last 15 years, which has enabled us together to grow this work uh, in Japan and elsewhere. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, uh, I want to thank uh, two uh, wonderful teachers of mine, uh, Case van der Heiden and Ed Schein, uh, both of whom uh, passed away in the last month. So I want to dedicate my talk to the two of them. Uh, Ed Schein's books uh, have also been published by AG Press, and uh, so there's copies at the back. And uh, thirdly, I wanted to uh, thank uh, my friends in Japan. Some of you are here today. I've been coming here since 1986 uh, regularly and enthusiastically, and I've learned a lot from you about what it means to to live and work together in this time. So I'm really very happy to have this opportunity to share with you some new thinking uh, in progress uh, on this subject. <clears throat> so here is a hopeful story. Uh, last November, I went to participate in the COP27 a climate conference in Egypt. Uh, the climate crisis threatens all of us, and it demands that we make extraordinarily large and complex and daunting set of changes uh, at three levels. We have to transform our energy, industrial, food, transportation, and financial systems. We have to transform in some way the underlying economic and political and cultural systems, and most fundamentally, we have to transform how we relate with one another and with the planet uh, that we share. So uh, on the one hand, uh, everybody is threatened by climate change, and so everyone has a general interest in contributing to these transformations, but at the same time, uh, different people and organizations and countries have very different specific interest capacities, understandings, and ambitions. If you think about the differences between subsistence farmers in Kenya and coal workers in Germany, between the governments of the US and China, between corporations and activists, between young students and middle-aged retirees. And so to be able to effect these transformations, these st stakeholders must find a way to work together. But this is not straightforward or easy. Uh, when I was in Egypt last November, uh, there were 35,000 people at this conference government representatives, NGO leaders, business people, scientists, and they'd come together from all over the world to work on these transformations. Everybody knew that they could not do much by themselves and that they therefore had to work with others, including with people they didn't agree with or like or trust. And so what was happening at this meeting is that every day for two full weeks, there were hundreds of parallel meetings, panels, workshops, negotiating sessions to search for ways to move forward on this global issue. And uh, the main open area for accredited delegates where I spent my time uh, consisted of three enormous uh, single-story prefab buildings, probably as large as this building, and each of these buildings contained long hallways of uh, open-ended pavilions where there were meetings of all sorts taking place all at the same time, 
all day, every day. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I had the feeling of being in a sprawling, cacophonous, social transformation bazaar. And I found this experience both exciting uh, and overwhelming. Um, after I left and had the chance to, to reflect on the experience, I realized that it had helped me get clear on some very basic things. The collaborations which took place at this conference had produced progress on climate change but not nearly enough for us to be able to be on track to prevent more and more climate catastrophes. It's not probable that over the coming years we will succeed in getting on track, but it is possible. Getting on track will require much more and much better collaboration, and such collaboration is possible. Last year, somebody uh, told me that the philosopher Moses Maimonides said, hope is a belief in the plausibility of the possible, not only the necessity of the probable. I am hopeful. Here is the primary question I've been asking myself over the past 30 years since I had the first experience with this work uh, in South Africa. What does it take to collaborate with diverse others to address the daunting challenges of our time? Or to put it in more basic terms, what is a way of working and living and being together that is required of us now at this moment in history? Uh, my vocation is as a practical practitioner. I facilitate collaborations among diverse stakeholders who are trying to transform the social systems they're part of. I started doing this work in 1991 in South Africa during that country's transition from racial oppression to non-racial democracy. This transformation was not straightforward or easy because there were really uh, deep differences among South Africans in their positions, ideologies, cultures, and needs, which had been produced and amplified by a long history of colonialism and apartheid. Uh, I facilitated a process called the Montfleur Scenario Exercise in which 28 South African leaders, black and white, men and women, uh, from the left and right, the opposition and the establishment, from politics, business, trade unions, community leaders and academics, worked together over a year to chart a way forward to transforming their country. And the participants in this exercise made a significant contribution to the transformation of South Africa. It was through this extraordinary experience that I discovered my vocation as a facilitator. And over the three decades since then, my colleagues and I have facilitated tens of such multi-stakeholder collaborations in all parts of the world at all scales, on all kinds of social transformations including relating to health, education, food, energy, development, justice, security, government, governance, peace, and climate. I think the gift I've received from having uh, been lucky enough to participate uh, in such extraordinary contexts like South Africa is that these experiences have shown me the dynamics of social transformation when they're painted in bright colors. But I think that exactly the same dynamics are present in ordinary contexts, in families, in organizations and communities, but there they're often painted in muted colors and so are harder to make out. But 
the seeing it in these extraordinary situations has enabled me to understand the dynamics that uh, I believe are universal. So 30 years of uh, this practical experience from Montfleur uh, up to a COP27 at the end of last year, you could say it's given me uh, uh, many opportunities for trial and many opportunities for error. <laughs> and so for this reason, many opportunities for learning. And uh, I've written five books trying to construct a theory for such work out of this practice and trying to connect this to the theory and practice of others. Uh, I was trained as a physicist and an economist, and there's a joke about economists that applies to me. An economist is someone who lies awake in bed at night wondering whether what works in practice can ever really work in theory. So that's what I have been doing. And today what I want to do is to explain what I'm in the process of learning. I want to share with you uh, some thoughts uh, in development uh, about what it takes to collaborate to transform social systems, uh, both in practice and in theory. So the starting point is that, uh, in my understanding, collaboration is becoming both increasingly necessary and at the same time increasingly difficult. This is because the challenges we face involve more stakeholders who need and want to be involved in addressing these challenges, including because they are less willing to defer to experts and elites. And in this context, the conventional way of getting things done is increasingly ineffective. To address our challenges effectively, we therefore need an unconventional way that I'm calling radical collaboration. It's radical in the sense that it gets to the root of what it takes to transform rather than only reform our existing social systems. Eiji San said to me last night that our existing social systems are working less and less well, but we remain loyal to them anyway. So radical transformation is what is required, not just to reform these systems, but to transform them. So what I am trying to understand now and what I want to talk about today is what does radical collaboration take? There's a phrase by a uh, uh, an American essayist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he said, I wouldn't give anything for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my right arm for simplicity on the other side of complexity. And so here, uh, what I want to share with you is my, my attempt at such a, a useful simplification. To give you the conclusion up front, Radical collaboration is a way of working together with diverse others to transform social systems that engages three universal human drives, a love and power and justice. Radical collaboration requires that we be able to work with all three of these drives the same way that uh, if we're trying to move through three-dimensional space, we have to be able to move up and down, side to side, and forward to back. This model of love, power, and justice is not a recipe for social transformation, but it offers a map of the social territory that we're in so that we can understand what's happening and also a set of practices for making our way through this territory so that we can transform what is happening. 
Uh, one of the pioneers of my field facilitation was a man named Kurt Lewin, and he said, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. So I'm working with this model of love, power, and justice because I find it practical. And today I want to share with you my current understanding, and I'm interested in knowing how it relates to uh, the experiences of work that you're doing. I read the, the uh, forms you filled in in registering, uh, and uh, you're doing extraordinary work in so many different domains. Uh, uh, we, uh, so I'm very happy to be in the room with you, and I'm interested in whether you find uh, this theory practical. Okay. The first force that was driving what was happening at COP27 in Egypt was the obvious one. The 35,000 people who participated did so because they were concerned about the climate crisis and because they wanted to contribute to addressing it. The slogan which uh, expressed the shared concern, uh, which was used a lot there, uh, is the slogan, keep 1.5 alive, which means working together to limit the uh, increase in the uh, average temperature of the Earth's surface to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And la uh, last November, uh, the increasingly frequent and severe climate catastrophes, including the terrible flooding in Pakistan, were on everybody's minds. The participants understood that they were part of a global system, a social, economic, political, technological, environmental, cultural system, that this system was dangerously or is dangerously out of balance and that they needed to find a way to collaborate with diverse others to get it more into balance. <clears throat> now, I'm calling this first drive love. And I'm using this word not in the sense of romantic love, but in the sense suggested by the theologian Paul Tillich, who wrote, love is the drive towards the unity of the separated. <clears throat> Everybody is driven by love. Everybody is driven towards the unity of the separated, although they have very different understandings of what it is that needs to be reunited. Often they're focused on reuniting the smaller circles of their family or their organization or their community. As fragmentation, polarization, and demonization increase, love becomes both more difficult and more important. The participants in COP27, for example, had come together to heal separations in the world between people and planet, between north and south, between east and west, and between government, civil society, and business. Love arises from the reality of interconnection and interdependence, that we are part of larger wholes. So if one dimension of social systems is such partness, then love is the drive that enables us to move side by side in this first dimension. The diagram uh, is in the packs? Yeah. So sorry, I'm, you'll find just uh, uh, one diagram in your packs, which, <laughs> which summarizes this argument. Uh, uh, yes, that one. Uh, yes, yeah. That's it, thank you. So I'm, <laughs> I wanted to give you at least a little bit of help in this uh, useful simplification. So to repeat, if one dimension of social systems is such partness, then love is the drive that enables us to move side by side in this dimension. 
Love is the essence of collaboration because collaboration involves people coming together. When the members of the Montfleur team came together in 1991 from across their apartheid separateness to look for ways that South Africa could heal its brokenness, they were, in this sense of the word, driven by love. In fact, the word apartheid, the word in the Afrikaans language, apartheid, just means apartness. So to overcome apartheid literally means to overcome separation. And it's, that's the sense I'm using the word love. But it wasn't uh, until 1997 in working in the country of Guatemala that I grasped the deeper potential of love for social transformation. I was facilitating a workshop there uh, one year after the signing of the peace accords, which ended a 36 year genocidal uh, civil war between the military and the urban elite on one side and guerrilla groups and the indigenous majority uh, on the other hand. This workshop was the beginning of a project that brought together leaders from across these extraordinary divisions to see how they could contribute to healing the, uh, the, the torn country. And the people in the room were leaders who had been on different sides of this war, and so the room was thick with suspicion. Uh, at one point in that workshop, a man named Ronoth Orquieta, who was a human rights uh, investigator, told the story of having gone uh, to an indigenous village to observe the exhumation of a mass grave from a wartime massacre. And when the earth had been taken out of the grave, Okieta noticed a lot of small bones on the earth. And he asked the forensic scientist who was supervising the exhumation, did people have their bones broken during this massacre? And the scientist said no. Uh, the, uh, the massacre included um, a number of pregnant women, and these are the bones of their fetuses. So you can feel the impact of that story here, uh, other side of the world 30 years later. Maybe you can imagine the impact of that story in the country where it occurred with people from the war that had happened just a few years before. The room fell completely silent, a silence like this, but more profound. And people were silent for a long time. And then the team took a break, a coffee break, and afterwards they continued with their work. And in the years that followed, uh, this group of people collaborated on many different national initiatives, four presidential campaigns, contributions to a commission, a truth commission, a tax reform commission, a peace accords commission, work on municipal development strategies, a national anti-poverty strategy, a new university curriculum. And through these efforts, the people who had been in the room contributed to the transformation of their country. A few years later, some researchers interviewed the members of this team. And quite a few members of the team said that it was those moments of silence that had enabled them to make these collective contributions to social transformation. One of them said, in giving his testimony, Okieta was sincere, calm, and serene without a trace of hate in his voice. This gave way to a moment of silence that I would say lasted at least one minute. It was horrible. It was a very moving experience for all of us. If you ask any of us, we would say that this moment was like a large communion. Another one said, after listening to Okieta's story, 
I understood and felt in my heart all that had happened. And there was a feeling that we must struggle to prevent this from happening again. I told this story to a, a priest, a Roman Catholic priest. Guatemala is a, a primarily Roman Catholic country. And he explained to me that in such a context, to refer to something as a moment of communion means that the participants experience themselves to be literally one body. Okieta's storytelling enabled them to connect to one another, to their situation, and to what it is they needed to do. So this Guatemalan experience focused my attention on uh, working with love as the essence of collaboration and provided the climactic end to my first book, Solving Tough Problems. I told this story to a facilitator in Boston named Laura Chasen, and she uh, uh, had a very interesting reply. She said, uh, your story reminds me of something that happened when my husband had a terrible accident. He was swimming in a lake and a motorboat ran over his leg and cut a very deep wound in his, uh, in his leg. So we took him to the hospital and uh, the doctor cleaned the wound, but it was too large uh, to be sewn up. And the doctor said to me, to, to Laura Chasen, um, uh, the two sides of the wound will reach out to each other. The wound wants to be whole. And so uh, Laura said to me, the dialogues that you and I are involved in, that, that all of us are involved in, uh, are like that. The participants and the human systems they're part of want to be whole. Our job as facilitators is simply to help create a clean, safe space. Then the healing will occur. So radical collaboration employs love by bringing stakeholders together in a clean, safe space and a structured, open process that enable them to meet, connect, talk, share, and unite. My specific reason for going to COP27 was to share the work of an initiative that uh, Rios had organized, which is called the Radical Climate Collaboration Initiative. The first product of this initiative uh, is a publication which is called Radical Collaboration to Accelerate Climate Action. Uh, it's available on the internet. Uh, we'll give you the URL later, and it will be published in a few weeks also in Japanese, thanks to uh, Change Agent. And this little guidebook offers seven practices for radical collaboration. And the first two of these practices, uh, the things you should do, uh, are practical ways to work with love. The first of these, uh, and the seven are listed in the other uh, diagram in your book, the first of these seven practices is play your role which means working out your specific part or contribution to the systemic transformation. The opposite of play your role, the don't, the, if, if play your role is the first do, then the first don't is ignore interdependencies, which means just doing what you want to do regardless of what others are doing or what is needed. The second of these practices, which also relates to love, is find necessary allies, which means searching out people with whom you need to collaborate in order to be able to play your role. And the opposite is stay comfortable, which means just working with people you know and like and agree with. So, radical collaboration must work with love. To avoid working with love is to ignore the reality of interdependence. Collaboration that does not harness love will not transform social systems. But working with love is not at all straightforward. If love is the drive to reunite the separated, then what is the whole that is being reunited? 
There's no such thing as the whole, except in some irrelevant cosmic sense. Uh, the Montreal poet Leonard Cohen uh, has a song where he says, though it all may be one in the higher eye, down here where we live, it is two. So down here where we live, there's not one, there are many holons, which means holes that are part of larger holes. For example, I am a hole in myself, I'm part of the holon of my family, a part of the holon of my company, part of the holon of friends of uh, Riichiro and Eiji, part of the whole of this group here today. One of the reasons it's not straightforward to address uh, a challenge like climate change is that the drive to reunite the separated is operating in many contradictory ways uh, at the same time. We're trying to reunite all life on Earth and all humanity, but also individual countries, individual alliances, individual organizations, and all of these holons have different interests. So we need to work with love, but this is not easy. And working with love is also not enough to be able to transform social systems. John Lennon was not correct when he sang, all you need is love. The theory and practice that I outlined in that first book, Solving Tough Problems, were inadequate. I was missing something. 10 years after that Guatemala workshop where Okieta had told his story, I met with uh, one of the members of that team, Clara Arenas, a researcher, and she was very straightforward in challenging uh, what I had written in the book, which had then been published, and that I was giving to this notion of love. She said, do you know, Adam, that last week, my NGO organization took out a full page advertisement in the Guatemala City newspaper saying that we would no longer participate in any dialogues with the government. The government said that the precondition for us participating in dialogue is that we stop uh, uh, marching and demonstrating in the street. But these actions are the main way we mobilize and manifest our power. And if dialoguing means we have to give up our power, then we're not interested. What I realized I was missing in my first understanding was power. Radical collaboration relies on individual and collective power of participating stakeholders who want to transform the system and to prevail over those who want to maintain the status quo. Collaboration that does not harness power will not transform social systems. And at COP27, power was the second driving force. This bazaar-like cacophony that was so loud in these uh, three huge halls was the sound of thousands of stakeholders, each expressing their power through presenting, proposing, pushing, pitching, protesting, and in doing this, making agreements and deals with others to be able to make larger contributions to addressing the climate crisis. Paul Tillich defined power as the drive of everything living to realize itself. Power in this sense does not primarily mean power over oppression, it means power to. Everybody is driven by power, although they have different understandings of what power needs to be used to do. Often they're focused on their own power or the power of their family or organization or community. Power arises from the reality of the autonomy, agency, and ambition of each and every whole on. So if the second dimension of social systems is such wholeness, then power is the drive that enables us to move up and down in this dimension. One of the students of Paul Tillich, 
was the civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. And King said, power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. It's the strength required to bring about social, political, and economic change. And one of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites, polar opposites, so that love is identified with a resignation of power and power with the denial of love. We've got to get this thing right. What we need to realize is that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. It is precisely this collision of immoral power with powerless morality which constitutes the major crisis of our time. And it was this statement by King which inspired me to write my second book, available from the stand at the back of the room. Uh, did I get that right, uh, Eiji-san? Uh, which is the book Power and Love. Radical collaboration employs power when stakeholders are each enabled to assert their wholeness, their purpose, perspective, and position. So the third practice of radical collaboration is build collective power, which means working together with other stakeholders to find and enact ways to transform the system. The opposite is force your way which means just trying to get everybody to do what you want them to do. So, radical collaboration must work with power. To avoid working with power is to ignore the reality of self-realization and self-interest. But working with power is not at all straightforward. When different people and organizations, each with their own purpose, try to collaborate, they usually produce competition and conflict. So if you are experiencing this and you think it's unusual, it's not at all unusual. It follows directly from this dimension of social reality. The practice that is required to work with power is the fourth one, work your differences, which m means working through or around our differences. The opposite, the don't do, is demand agreement, which assumes incorrectly that progress requires agreement. We need to work with power, but this is not easy. <clears throat> and working with love and power are also not enough to be able to transform social systems. The theory and practice I outlined in Power and Love are also inadequate. Again, I was missing something. <clears throat> and again, it was Clara Arenas who pointed this out to me when she wrote me, I see a certain naivete in your vision of a balance between power and love, in which things can be improved, leaving everybody satisfied. How can this be in a context of great imbalance or inequity as in Guatemala, how can poverty be uprooted without some sectors of society being very dissatisfied? It is their economic interests which will be affected. I think that balance and satisfaction for all are possible in the realm of theory, but not when you go down to real politics in a context of enormous inequality. What I was missing was justice. Philosopher Nancy Fraser says, justice is never actually encountered directly. By contrast, we do experience injustice, and it is through this that we form an idea of justice. Justice, then, is the drive to reduce injustice. Injustice is some people using their power to exclude or limit or suffocate the power of others. The global Black Lives Matter social transformation movement was sparked by an egregious example of such suffocation. Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin kneeling on the neck of George Floyd for nine minutes until he died. 
At COP27, justice was the third driving force. The injustice of the climate crisis is also egregious. The people who are suffering the most from climate change, primarily in the global south, are not the people who cause the change or have means to adapt to the change. And this injustice has been at the very center of climate negotiations uh, since the signing of the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which talks about common and differentiated responsibilities of different countries. Many stakeholders in the South are unwilling to collaborate with those in the North unless this injustice is properly addressed. And the most important breakthroughs at COP27 were agreements to bridge this gap by providing funds from the North to the South to compensate for historical loss and damage and to enable just transitions away from fossil fuels. Justice is required for collaboration to be able to transform social systems. Transforming social systems effectively requires the participation of all stakeholders. Stakeholders who think that they are being treated unfairly will not participate. They will not contribute their power to effecting transformation, or even more, they will use their power to block transformation. Collaboration that does not harness justice will not transform social systems. Everybody is driven by justice, although they have different understandings of who is being treated unfairly. Often they think that is, that is they or their organization or community that's being treated unfairly. In 2010, I started a project in Thailand to deal with the a conflict between the red shirts and the yellow shirts. And the organizers of the project uh, had set up a series of meetings for me with leaders from different uh, 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 political and uh, business and community organizations. And for three full days, I sat in a, in a windowless a conference uh, hotel room in Bangkok, listening to each of these people one at a time, explaining to me how they looked at things. And uh, I found the whole experience bewildering. I, I couldn't understand what they were saying, this completely unfamiliar uh, country and context and culture. But then what I realized is actually everybody had been saying exactly the same thing. They were all saying that they were right and the others were wrong, or more specifically, that they were being treated unfairly and were the victims of injustice. They were not simply complaining to me, they were appealing to a shared sense of fairness. Uh, there's a famous book about justice by the Indian uh, philosopher Amartya Sen. It's a difficult book to understand, but the very first sentence of the book is interesting. He says, in the little world of children, says Pip in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, there is nothing so finely perceived and finely felt as injustice. This strong perception of manifest injustice applies to adult human beings as well. What moves us reasonably enough is not the realization that the world falls short of being completely just, which few of us expect, but that there, clearly, there are clearly remediable injustices around us which we want to eliminate. So justice arises from the reality that unfair social systems prevent people from participating as equals, as peers, and that such unfairness produces a drive to transform that system. So if a third dimension of social systems is such fairness, then justice is the drive that enables us to move back and forth in this dimension. Justice transforms structures so that more people can employ more of their power and more of their love. Radical collaboration must work with justice. To avoid working with justice is to ignore the reality and consequences of injustice. 
but working with justice is not straightforward. Different people have incommensurately different ideas of how to assess fairness and who is being treated unfairly. And it is difficult to transform social systems when the people who benefit from the status quo fight to maintain their power positions and privileges. We need to work with justice, but it is not easy. So let me summarize. Transforming social systems collaboratively requires working with love and power and justice. This is the work in progress theory and practice that I started to articulate in my most recent book, Facilitating Breakthrough, the one that you have, and that I am continuing to work on now. All three of these drives are present in all social systems. I feel all three of these drives within myself, and I see all three of these drives on the front page of the newspaper every day. If you're trying to transform a social system and you aren't able to grasp and work with all three of these drives, then you will find yourself confused and frustrated. Trying to move through social space while pretending that one of these drives doesn't exist is like trying to, pretend to move through physical space while pretending that gravity doesn't exist. You won't get where you're trying to go and you'll probably fall down and hurt yourself. All of the impactful social transformation processes I have been involved in over the last 30 years have engaged all three drives. Many people focus only on love or power or justice, but this is a mistake. Working only with love, ignoring power and justice produces results that are, as King put it, sentimental and anemic. Working only with power, ignoring love and justice, produces results that are reckless and abusive. And working only with justice, ignoring love and power, produces results that are legalistic and sterile. Working with love, power, and justice together is never easy because these three drives are in permanent tension. The fifth practice of radical collaboration is therefore care for yourselves, which means attending to the human challenges of this work. The opposite, the don't do, is just keep pushing. Keep pushing yourself, keep pushing others, which uh, only produces uh, burnout and frustration. There is no static point of balance among love, power, and justice. We have to create a dynamic balance. We have to move back and forth among these drives and to discover our way forward through trial and error. The sixth practice is discover ways forward, which means employing love, power, and justice as each is needed, taking one step at a time, learning and adjusting as we go. The opposite is drive straight ahead which means deciding on a course of action and continuing on this course regardless of whether it is working. How do we create love, power, and justice re required to transform social systems? The good news is we don't have to do this. Each person, every person has within themselves all three of these drives. So we don't need to create love, power, and justice. We just need to unblock them. This crucial insight was provided to me in 2017 by the priest Francisco de Roux, who had just been appointed as the president of the Truth Commission in Colombia. I was facilitating a workshop of, of Colombians, a difficult workshop. Um, it was going well. People were starting to, to relax and work together in spite of their very big differences. And uh, at the end of the first day, they had begun to relax and to hope they could do something together. Uh, then when we all got up for dinner, uh, Francisco came running up to me very excited. He said, Adam, I see what you're doing. I said, Francisco, what, what am I doing? He said, you are removing the obstacles 
to the expression of the mystery. Duru was saying that enabling social transformation does not require creating love, power, and justice. It only requires removing the obstacles to the expression of these universal innate drives. The last of the seven practices of radical collaboration is share hopeful stories, meaning offer images of what is possible that help people find their way forward together. The whole set of seven practices is a way to remove the obstacles to the expression of love, power, and justice. So here then is the short version of the hopeful story that I want to share. It is possible to transform social systems through radical collaboration. We do this through unblocking love and power and justice and through feeling our way forward towards a world with more love and more power and more justice. Making progress in this way is not straightforward or easy, but it can be done and it must be done it is the only way collaboratively to address the daunting challenges of our time. Thank you very much.